Hey, Big Kahuna here. Uh, Cops for Trump video, August 8th, 2024. Uh, let's get into the politics end of things. Uh, we can, I want to reiterate what I said last week. We cannot allow Kamala Harris and Tim Walls to become the power in the United States. Uh, you could see their records that the mainstream media is trying to scrub up for them. Kamala Harris established a, first of all, she was a big supporter of Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. uh, since Ferguson. She is a, um, she started up the uh, fund that bailed out violent criminals uh, from the BLM riots, the BLM uh, people uh, is uh, they these people she bailed out had uh, been involved in violent crimes, uh, murders and rapes. Uh, Walls Walls sat by while Minneapolis burned in the BLM riots. Uh, the uh, third police sink fell because Walls and uh, the mayor told the officers to stand down. Now, uh, this today's Thursday, and this weekend is the 10th anniversary of the uh, uh, Michael Brown incident, and I anticipate there being some shit going on there in Ferguson. Uh... We lost a number of officers this week. Uh, I did not, because of being rushed with this, I did not get to check the LOD vet, vet, um, website. So uh, the um, proper accounting for um, end of watch was not, uh, I did not get that and I apologize on that. Uh, you might not notice a back the blue banner in the back. Got that from Michelle Visconti from uh, the Trump rally up in Charlotte. Uh, so thank you, Michelle. Uh, this week, I also, uh, after six weeks, got my blue line MAGA hat. Uh, got to get my notes back up. They faded. Uh, I'm going to tell you my story because I got hit by a lot of crap on social media. Uh, pages called Cops for Trump, South Carolina. And people were saying, well, you you weren't no South, you weren't no cop. They were telling me I wasn't a cop and that I, was, and I wasn't a cop from South Carolina. That's true. I was a cop in Pennsylvania. Uh, I kind of give you my bio here. Uh, I went to Reading Police Academy. Uh, it was a part-time course for 480 hours, three nights a week for eight months. And uh, I began in September 3rd, 1984. Now, my first day on the job uh, for the uh, uh, Moton Borough Police Department was October 10th, 1984. And the Borough of Moton was pretty unconventional. It was kind of like Mayberry. I went for an interview with the chief of police, Chief Studener. And after uh, that interview, uh, he took me down to the mayor's house. And I was sworn in in the mayor's living room. Just 20 minutes after the interview, I was sworn in. And he's standing there in his boxer shorts, <laughs> Mayor Pinkavage. Now, after being sworn in, I went back to the borough hall and I met Sergeant Blankenbiller. And Sergeant Blankenbiller is the quartermaster. And he issued me my uniforms, my badge, my gun. Uh, he issued me everything. And then I worked the 4 to 12 shift with him. Now, I, at 10 a.m., I was being interviewed. 11 30, I'm, I'm being sworn in. And then four, I worked the 4 to 12 with him riding around. Now, I was trained on second shift for about a week. And then they turned me loose on the midnight to eight shift. Now I'm pre-certified. I haven't, it, it's still October. It's like, it was, 
October 20th that I worked my first shift, third shift. And that's because Sergeant Bowers uh, was uh, frequently absent because of health problems. And I ended up getting my full-time position simply because of the uh, number of hours I worked in a year. Uh, I didn't go through civil service. That's just how things were. If you were a part-timer and you worked so many hours in a year, you were considered a full-time officer. I got to call my notes back up. Uh, I was 19 years old when I uh, became a police officer. And I was only getting paid $7.50 an hour back in 1984. Now, I'm going to get to the case that really pissed me off and broke my heart. Uh, uh, we had a kid that hung out in the playground that was mentally char challenged. His name was Jason. And uh, he, uh, he would run up to the patrol car every time we went through the playground parking lot. And he was pretty much a snitch. He told told us everything uh, that the bad kids did in the playground, and uh, uh, some of his information actually led to arrests. So, but yeah, he just loved the police, and he said he was wanted to be a policeman when he grew up. And you know that wasn't really possible considering his his deficiencies. But we we all we all loved the kid. He was he was a really sweet kid. And one day I got a call to go to this one home. And uh, this man was a foster parent. And he took kids that were, uh, he took kids that had, that needed special help. And two of his kids were being tutored by a man on, uh, down behind Koenig. He had an apartment down behind Koenig's garage. It was a studio apartment. And they showed up early for their tutoring session one day and uh, only to see this man sodomizing Jason on his sofa, on his sofa bed. So, um, and they went and uh, told their, uh, their foster father. Now, he didn't really believe it because of their disabilities, and I didn't really believe it at first because of their disabilities but i went and uh to the house and talked to the mother and the mother agreed for jason to come to the borough hall because we were going to film his film an interview and turned out to be true turned out to be true and uh the uh we took him to a ho hospital for examination and the evidence showed that he was he was raped um uh, now all this time the, you know this child of early th teens who had a diminished mental capacity uh was saying it was consensual uh and uh really this kid he had no ability to, he had he lacked what they call men's ray to to consent he was flat out he was retarded um, but he was a sweet kid. So I took the statements and after the statements and the physical examination, the father got involved. Father didn't want anything to do with it. His kid wasn't raped. His kid's a fag, all this other stuff. Father wasn't a very nice person. So, uh, I talked to the district attorney. He said, because we don't have a co cooperating witness, we can't charge this piece of shit. Uh, about a week later, uh, Jason tried to jump out of a third floor window of his home. And I was holding him by his belt until the fire company came with a ladder. And uh, I was holding him by his belt and his legs, but I couldn't get him in because it back in the window uh, because of my the position I was in. If I would have tried too much harder, I would have fell out too. Uh so the fire company got him. Uh, that, um, then I consulted with the DA again, and the DA, you know, shot it down. But I continued to investigate, and I went to the local school district uh, that referred him 
as a tutor to Jason. And I was at the office and I asked about this and uh, they said, yeah, we referred them. Well, this one teacher overheard the conversation and pulled me aside and said, yeah, here's a, this, this individual, I'll come out with his name, David Stott, uh, was taken out of, he was forced to resign. And the reason for his resignation, it went around the district that he was molesting boys. And because he was allowed to resign, and this was before school districts ha had the mandatory requirement, he got a job in another school district, did the same freaking thing. And uh, then when he was forced to retire uh, from the second school district, then he became tutor, a tutor in his own home. This teacher couldn't believe that, you know, because regimes had changed in the school district. And people were not made aware of him that he molested kids, was forced to fire, be fired or forced to resign. And he continued, it, uh, he can, was ended up getting referrals from that same district years later. So um, that was pretty much the end of the case. And the father, uh, because the DA wouldn't, still wouldn't pr pursue it. And this was like, um, it reminds me so much of the, of the scandal involving priests where they got moved around. They, you know, bugger kids up in Boston and then they were sent to the Allentown diocese, which happened. Uh, but the father was uncooperative and the kid was uncooperative. That was the end of the case. Now, years later, uh, and we, I lost track of the kid because the father kicked him out. Years later, I uh, encountered him at Reading Hospital. Uh, my wife and I were heading, this was 1995. We were going to Lamont's class at Reading Hospital because my wife was expecting a baby. And here Jason is walking down, walking in as we were walking out. And I'm talking to him. And I said, well, did you, I said, did you, were you sick? Did you get out of here? Uh, he was there for the AIDS clinic. And he contracted AIDS because he became a prostitute for gay men, and uh, he contracted AIDS from one of them. Uh, last time I heard about him was, I saw his obituary a couple of years later. But that case, like I said, that's the one that pissed me off and broke my heart. Uh, I got my notes turned off again. Uh, snowed in uh, twice in my law enforcement career I got snowed in uh, once in the borough of Moton and once for the uh, uh, BCFSD which was the Berks County Facilities Security Division of the Sheriff's Department when I worked night court uh, when I got snowed in in Moton the uh, uh, I was there for 72 hours there was no way my 1984 Mercury Topaz could get me through the amount of snow that we had and a bulk of it came down in my shift. Now the borough was mostly steep hills on, it was ran kind of like in a valley. Uh, why I'm missing valley is what was considered. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, there was no way that big ass Crown Vic could pull those hills. So, the, um, I maintained a presence in the borough hall in 72 hours. I, I took naps. I watched television. I waited there. And then there would be calls. And how I handled calls was I went to the street department garage. The streets department was out with their big uh, truck. But I took a little truck that had a snowplow on it. It, it wasn't little either. It was a, it was small compared to the big dump truck that the borough streets department was using, and um, and they got stuck. <laughs> well, I used this big diesel crew cab with a long bed and a yellow flashing light, 
and I went and responded on calls. And two of them were EMS calls that the EMS could not get in from Lancaster Avenue. So I drove down and uh, they weren't, the truck, pickup truck wasn't plowing a path wide enough for the ambulance. So we took their stuff, put it in the back of the pickup truck, and I drove them to where they responded to. And uh, then I drove them back to the ambulance the, the, um, in this pickup truck with the patient in the back of the pickup truck on a, on a board, patient you know, and a paramedic. And uh, ended up doing, making two tron- uh, round trips for, the, for them uh, during the blizzard. And uh, uh, responded to some other calls, too, uh, that way. But when uh, when things were over and the roads were cleared, I went home. Now, when I went home, I got a not. I guess about a day after I got home, I got a phone call from uh, the new mayor, and the mayor and city council were damn mad that I stayed on duty for seventy two hours, not uh, because. I was snowed in, not because of my dedication to the job, but simply because they had to pay me time and a half after my first eight hours. Now, time and a half of seven fifty uh, is another three seventy five. So they were paying me eleven bucks an hour for the rest of that time. Not exactly breaking the bank. Um, now. After I let, um, uh, Moton was my dream job. It was a real, uh, everybody wanted to be where the action was. I loved it. I loved Moton. It was laid back. It was Mayberry. It was Mayberry north of the Mason Dixon line. It was my dream job to one day retire as chief of police. And I blew it. I was young. I was stupid. I was prideful. I was immature. And the people who wanted to help me, I hurt them. I, I, uh, I knew what I was doing. And the people who were trying to guide me, I was hit hurtful toward them. And I ended up resigning. Now, while I was still working in Moton, I was a narcotics investigator for the Berks County Narcotics Investigation Center. Uh, that didn't pay shit either. Um, I w- were to, It was mostly buy and bust cases. Uh, then I moved into a position uh, with the, uh, my notes, uh, Berks County Park Rangers. And that was kind of like a stepping stone uh, to the sheriff's department. Uh, the problem when you were working for the Brown County of Berks back then when the, uh, the John Kramer was sheriff, you didn't get very good equipment. In fact, you got next to no equipment. Uh, you had to carry your own gun, buy your own ammo. Uh, there was no standardized, uh, uh, no SOP whatsoever. Uh, they would put out a memo when there was an incident. Uh, so you had to carry, and everybody was carrying different caliber guns, different caliber bullets. This one clown that worked it with me in the, uh, the park rangers was carrying a single action Ruger Blackhawk 44 with a 10 inch barrel. 10 inch barrel single action 44. Ruger Blackhawk. Um, now, like I said, you're going to run into problems with that. No standardization, no standardization in teaching. And this was with the park rangers. And it was with the sheriff's department. It was with the BC, uh, uh, BCNIC and the BCFSD. Uh, now, after um, I worked for the park rangers, I got hired by the sheriff's department. And I was going to be, and I worked in the cell block with Chief Deputy Crawford. Now, I wasn't there two weeks, and uh, night court, uh, Reading District Court moved from City Hall to the courthouse. And uh, they needed night security for this. And what they did is they created its department, uh, uh, the 
within the sheriff's department. They had different divisions in the sheriff's department. You had the warrant division, and then you had another division that was uh, pretty much the, uh, they were the brown shirts. And, and then you had the uh, division that worked the cell block. Well, because the security division was, um, the other sheriffs were, uh, they were prone to our, invest, uh, our investigations and our uh, searches. Uh, th they were Teamsters, and it was decided that B the BCFSD was going to be a non-union group. Now, we were already members of the Teamsters, but they transferred me and two other guys to uh, the BCFSD uh, for night court. And we would take care of the cell block and the, the, the prisoner detention area up on the, the uh, second floor where the night court was. Uh, and the other guys who were hired, the department pretty much became a patronage hire uh, thing. Uh, some of them were constables. Some of them were just friends of friends and friends of relatives and relatives. So it became pretty much a patronage department. And they would run the metal detectors at the courthouse and the services center. And uh, on, during night court, they had uh, during the night you had one person in uh, in the garage at the Sally Port, two people downstairs, uh, one person upstairs on the second floor, one person on the doors on the Court Street side of the courthouse to let people in at shift change for. 911, because 911 was up on the 18th floor of the courthouse. So, um, and then we had another guy uh, who patrolled. And what happened is that guy, when he was done with his rounds, relieved the guy at the uh, Sally Port. And the guy from the Sally Port would come over and relieve the guy at Court Street. And then the Court Street guy would go make the rounds. And you made six rounds six rounds between midnight and 7 a.m. That's when the building opened up for, uh, for employees and, uh, the, uh, 911 center, uh, open. So we were doing, we had a shift, one shift from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. Um, uh, the, uh, one person worked 11 to seven. Uh, now this, this went on for a couple of years. I worked there and uh, they started cutting positions at, for night. So we, uh, to the point that we had no rounds going on and a guy decided he was going to climb the construction uh, elevator and he fell to his death. And if we had rounds, we would have found him, but he laid there till the next morning. He was impaled. Uh, now, this, like I said, um, after this happened, uh, they decided to um, eliminate the department and brought in rent-a-cops. And that was even worse because this rent-a-cop company had guys on parole and probation. And they were now guarding. We, we would see these guys. We would encounter these guys as they came in and meet, meet with their probation officer in the services center. So now these guys are running the place and all sorts of problems happen. They, they, uh, some people brought, got weapons past the metal detectors. This one guy, uh, bolted out of a courtroom, went down the fire escape, the, uh, the fire step, uh, steps, you know, and out the court street door of the services center. And he disappeared and they never found him again. Uh, back to my notes. Um, so our jobs were eliminated and, uh, then I was putting in for other police, other law enforcement jobs. And it was 1995, uh, 1996. I had two kids at home that were preschool age. One was two, one was one. They were 10 months apart. We had Irish twins. Uh, the, um, in 1996, I knew three uh, law enforcement officers that committed suicide. 
uh, one was a friend from the police academy, Mike Axe. He uh, killed his dog and himself in his police car. Uh, another one was a guy I just barely knew from night court. Uh, believe, uh, memory f serves me. I believe he was a Y missing police officer. But then you get to the case of Fred Brosman. Fred Brosman, we were pretty friendly towards each other, but I wouldn't, I mean, we went out for a couple of beers, but I wouldn't consider himself like, like that we were buddies. Fred was involved in a shooting the one night. I was pulling a double shift that night, 4 to 12, and uh, the, the third shift, and the second shift and third shift. And I was there the night that uh, Fred Brosman was involved in a shooting uh, down on uh, Pear Street. Uh, and the facts of the shooting were uh, he uh, he uh, shot this gang member named Frankie Mercado. That was, the street name was Chino. And uh, the reason he had to shoot this guy is Officer Lieberman was uh, attempting to he was restraining a person on the ground in the process of handcuffing him. McCardo was going to come up behind Lieberman and assassinate him. And Brosman shot him and killed him. Now, the gangs and the Latino community were, yeah, just like after the Michael Brown shooting and the uh, death, death of, of Floyd, of George Floyd, we had some problems, not nearly as bad as that, but they were driving around with the Puerto Rican flags in memory of Chino written on their windows with uh, white shoe polish, and they were stirring up problems. And it didn't help matter that matters that the local newspaper was printing bullshit, uh, stirring up the stirring the pot for circulation purposes. So. The mayor, Mayor Warren Haggerty, pretty much threw Fred under the bus, even though he he was still uh, being treated well by the department. Chief uh, Chief Sassaman treated him well, backed him up, hundred percent. Now there were no, more number of investigations into this shooting by running police's own internal investigation. Then later on, the state attorney general had Pennsylvania State Police investigate this. He was cleared once again. Then uh, the FBI's um, uh, what the hell? Civil Rights Division came in. Janet Reno's Civil Rights Division, the FBI, Justice Department, came in and investigated. Once again, he was cleared. So then there was a coroner's inquest. Now, this coroner's inquest... The coroner controls the court, the courtroom for that. You have a courtroom, I believe it's six jurors. Now, um, because of all the death threats and the threats of violence towards uh, Fred, he um, the the coroner wanted armed court, armed officers in the courtroom, and uh, the chief judge says he doesn't want guns in the in the courthouse and he said well the only people with weapons then is going to be the the bad guys so the coroner actually went against the uh wishes of the chief judge and demanded that he had an armed officer in the courtroom now when fred brosman when fred showed up he had a, he had a guard with him, he had an he had an officer, a uniformed officer, with him for security purposes because of the threats. And um, he came; they came in through the judge's parking lot, took the judge's elevator up to the courtroom. You had two armed officers, me and this other running officer, in the courtroom uh, during the incident. He was with Fred. I was at the door. This all the facts of this case was presented to a jur to this jury. And there were Hispanic people on this jury because Redding was predominant, even back then, was predominantly Latino. 
they deliberated for nine minutes and found that uh, he was justified in the shooting. Nine minutes. And this caused some more upheaval. We had this Hispanic version of Al Sharpton come to Reading, you know, stirring the pot once again. And uh, Fred wasn't able to return to duty. He uh, was chased around the fairgrounds mall by gangbangers with his with a with his the woman he was seeing at the time. I'm not sure if he was ever married or if this was his wife or his girlfriend. So whoever, whoever she was, she left him. This and all this occurred in '92 and 1996. He was facing a wrongful death lawsuit, and he put on his uniform, laid in his bed, and shot himself in the chest. And that was pretty much it for me, those three suicides. And I said to my wife, now, I seen the trajectory, even back then, of where society was, this is, you know, decades before Black Lives Matter, decades before defund the police, I seen the trajectory. And I seen what happened there. And I had two little boys. And I didn't want that for my family. So I took a job in a powder coatings plant. And then... Got a job with the Reading School District about a month and a half later. And uh, I stayed there for 26 years until I got injured. Uh, and now I'm on disability. So I wasn't the best cop in the world. I told you about how I, uh, the immaturity I had back in the 80s and how I hurt people. But I, got, I evolved and I got better. And if I were able to complete 20 years, 30 years, like some of the people in my police academy class, um, I think I would have been a good chief of police. If only, you know, and I would have redeem, redeemed myself uh, from this crap that went on in my early years. It's one of the greatest regrets in my life uh, simply because uh, they were only trying to guide me. They were only trying to help me and make me a better cop. And that it's pretty much my story in law enforcement. Uh, that's all I got to say today. Uh, stay safe. God bless.